which all these kind of uh, the wins. Uh, coming back to the point, Elgo Trading. I see you guys have spent a lot of time today, you know, listening to all the great speakers we had over here regarding Elgo Trading and you know what you can achieve with Elgo Trading. So I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to keep it brief, basic for people who are entrants into Elgo Trading. But if you guys have any advanced questions, feel free to ask me, and you can stop me in between while I'm talking about these uh, stuff, basic stuff over here. So basically, you know, when we look at Investing, we all talk about investment is a science, it's an art, what exactly it is. I think it's a mixture of both of them. I'll quickly go into it, you know, as an art investment. Basically, the art comes in because you have to control your greed, your fear, your pride, your laziness, things which are an average trader is always subjected to. And if you look at the science part of it, the science part really is when you're looking at investments, you have to gather your facts, you have to create rules for uh, the facts that you've gathered, you have to do the back testing, you have to uh, manage the latency which I believe is one of the biggest issues that all Echo traders either have now or in India they will face it in the next five years. Um, how do we put them all together? That The easiest question is, okay, how do you take your emotions out? How do you put your rules into place? How do you constantly keep on doing a rinse and repeat process around your rules and regulations? That's really where the elbow trading comes into the picture, where you can basically you know, put everything into a computer, forget about it, let the computer follow the rules and regulations of it, and you can swatch it. That's really how the it, you know that's really how algo trading came into a picture. You know, where you take the human emotions out, you put the rules, you have someone who can calculate quickly, things so on and so forth. You say, RSI goes above 70, I'm going to sell, goes below 30, I'm going to buy. You're like, no, no, no. I have seen historically 70 to sell, not 80 to buy. So I 80 to buy, I sell. I go below 20 to buy. No, no, no. If I have to go 83.275, then perfect. Why do you think I have bad test? Now there is no logic between going to that number of 83.275. You just did a back testing and you found that the perfect result came at 83.275. So that's perfect. You're trying to fit best results to your own assumption and you're just tweaking the numbers to it because numbers will join because it's a limited data set. When you go into the future, those numbers will not join because it doesn't apply. So that's why you have to avoid those kind of perfecting. Just keep it simple, absolutely simple. If you're putting up a number, there are two kinds of numbers. One is a constant and one is a variable. Variable never bothers you. What bothers you is a constant. Whenever you're putting up a constant, you're putting an assumption into your strategy. So you have to be very diligent in making sure the constant you're putting in your strategies are very well researched for. There's a fact why that constant is a specific number and not another number. So that's perfect. Anything else, guys? So how do we do future testing? Like, I can do the back test for the last 12 years. Uh -huh. So, but then how do I do future testing? Um, there are two ways uh, that we've done it, uh, or we used to do it our hedge funds. Uh, one is, you can do back testing. Let's say, for example, you have a 12 year period. Right. You do back testing on six years. And then six years. Future. And then you apply to the next six years. Or you do back testing on all the 12 years, and then you actually run your model on a simulated market okay. in future to see if that is applying anymore or not. Because the longer you go in back testing, the less relevant it becomes. If you have time, I have another question actually. Sure. Um, can you give a practical, a little example? Everyone can understand about unsupervised machine learning. Uh, something little practical. Maybe you might have been uh, doing that already. Uh, see, uh, uh, it, it, it would, uh, I'm not sure how many can of worms that would open up if I talk about that. Right. Uh, but typically, uh, Facebook is an example. Uh, you know where those kind of things happen. Um, basically, uh, that, that's that's a risk area, and that uh, that that is an area where we think uh, it can potentially create a lot of issues in future, because that's where uh, you know all these uh, science fictions will start coming true. Uh, but as as the word goes, unsupervised is where you let machines sort of experiment, and you give them much more variables into the equation, where they can twist and tweak the equations as much as they want to. Uh, and, you know, so it creates. Uh, something it creates its own data set. It creates its own uh, minimas and maximas. Any, any example related to the markets so that people would understand? Um, talk about flash crashes. Yes. Where do they come from? Okay. So those kind of things is where you know people don't know. And in, in India also we had a flash crash. Can GDP. I also request an example of supervised machine learning? Simple stuff I did 15 years ago. Put up a spreadsheet over there, put the formulas, create the variables, and let the machine find out, for example, uh, you know, uh, that's more like a gray box. So when you go into the gray box, so the way we look at algo strategies, it's a black box, a gray box, 
uh, we have gray boxes where uh, humans uh, interact with the machine while they are operating black boxes where we don't interact with machines at all so for example a black box a black box would be i would have two computers one computer would be running a high frequency algorithm in it and it will not have any uh, uh, any screen because it takes time for me to render and show things on the screen and i will have an exact same system running parallel not talking to the system but run exact same things so i can see on that system what's happening up over here that's really a black box a gray box is when i'm working on the same system and i'm interfering you know so we can interfere uh, you know, with supervised machine learning, we basically apply our own critical reasoning into it. You can make it as complicated. You would know a bunch of stuff around that. But that's really a supervisor's way you step in and you say, no, now the rules have changed. Now the oil price average is going to be between 45 and 65, not between 75 and 100. And the algorithm should work like this. You know, those kind of things come in supervised machine learning.